take three. Three? Yeah. Well, make it ten. Ten? Twenty sponges should be plenty. Did you say twenty? Yeah. Twenty-five sponges is just fine. Twenty-five? Yeah. You said with twenty-five? Yeah. Yeah. Just give me the whole case. I'll be on my way. I just wanted to let you know about my study group. Oh, don't be a funny duddy. I'll be your study buddy. I'm about to embark on one of the great challenges of my scientific career. This work right here is going to change history. I think this is going to be our greatest mission. I don't have time to study. I'm never getting to Stanford. I got big plans for you tonight. I got maps. I got charts. I'm going to see you through this because my credibility is on the line. It's at this point that you'll want to start taking notes. Welcome to The Sitcom Study, the podcast where we contemplate the TV shows we grew up with and search for the truth and wisdom within the tropes and cliches. And today we've got a different sort of topic. What, or should I say whom, are we discussing today? We are discussing Julia Louis-Dreyfus and all of her many sitcoms how she was the lone actor to break the Seinfeld curse and have many, many wonderful characters that she played. Yeah. This was an element of the titular sitcom study that I was always sort of interested in, you know, because we talk about story tropes most of the time. And that's that's all well and good, but there's another... Yeah, it's in the intro, are tr- the tropes and cliches. But I would argue this is another kind of a trope wherein they try to build a new sitcom around a beloved personality. Or another way to look at it is they try to sort of pick up the pieces after a really popular ensemble show ends. And it's so interesting to me to see the way these things play out, especially in the post-Seinfeld, post-Friends landscape. I specifically remember watching... Matthew Perry, Jason Alexander, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, you know, have all these different shows over the years. And yes, it's not a story trope, but it's a different kind of phenomenon that we see again and again, where you have these really beloved or really interesting characters or actors or whatever it is. And the TV world tries to different levels of success to give them a new vessel. Right. Well, so it's trying to capitalize on someone's popularity, right? Like, whereas I think now things have sort of shifted to you're only going to get cast in a show if you have a certain number of Instagram followers or TikTok followers or whatever, or Twitter followers or something. So I think what people or what the network is looking for is that built-in audience. If you bring this many people with you, or if you can bring even a portion of what you had following you when you were on Seinfeld or when you were on Friends, then this show will will still be a ratings hit and we can just build from there. When you think about some of the most successful actors in the world that got their start on sitcoms, right? Tom Hanks, Will Smith, uh, nowadays, Chris Pratt. And you look back and you go, huh, like who would have thought when they were watching Bosom Buddies that Tom Hanks would be like considered the best actor ever? You know, who would have thought when they were watching Parks and Rec that the schlubby boyfriend character would go on to be in like every major franchise of the 2020s, like at the same time. On the flip side, you have these actors like Jason Alexander, where you go like, my God, this guy is so funny. This character is so amazing. We can't wait to see what this guy's going to do. You can have the whole world, you know, if, if as, as his oyster. And instead he has like two or three failed sitcoms. And then, you know, that's it. Cash the Seinfeld checks. Yeah. Well, and I think Jennifer Aniston to a certain extent as well, right? So you, ha- it's really difficult on the flip side of what you're saying to 
like you can't win for losing, right? If you get another show, half the people who are tuning in want to see you be Rachel again, and half the people want to see you do something totally different, and you have to walk that line. And the same is true when you're getting notes from the studio, right? Like the network and the studio, this is like half of them want you to be this and half of them want you to be the other thing. And so it's it's a really hard line to walk. And I think the reason that we see Julia Louis-Dreyfus have success in the ways that she did is, number one, she was the one that waited the longest. Like, she watched Michael the Michael Richards show fail. She watched the first Jason Alexander show fail and said, okay, I'm going to try something different. And it was. It was this totally – watching Ellie, which was like her pilot, her short-lived series that ran like three years after Seinfeld ended – she tried to do something completely different. It was a single camera show. It was done in real time. It was, you know, 22 minutes. So she really tried to do something different. I mean, it was in the style of like popular shows at that time, like Malcolm in the Middle, who were doing this more film looking sitcom. So I think that part of the equation is time and part of the equation is talent and Part of the equation is luck. Yes. Well, that's exactly my point in all of this. And this was what I was sort of musing over while I was having a hard time getting to sleep last night, because sometimes it seems like, yeah, friends couldn't have possibly existed without those six people. Or in turn, you know, Jennifer Aniston couldn't have possibly had that career without friends. Or could they? You know, it's just one of those sliding doors things that we'll never know. And it almost becomes a metaphor for everything in life. Because you look around you and yeah, your job and your relationship and where you live and everything is this weird combination of some of it is by chance, some of it is by design, some of it is based on our abilities. It's like that movie, Everything Everywhere All at Once, where in one universe, she's a movie star and in the other universe, she's a laundress, you know, and it's just all these different happenstances that make the difference. You know, like we talked about how Aniston had all of those pilots before Friends hit. And you could look and, at that. Uh, and Matt LeBlanc, too, was yeah. in a bunch of stuff. He was in a bunch of pilots. Right. So you could look at that and make the conclusion either way. You could go like, well, all of those pilots that she was in didn't work, and then Friends did work. So she's a moot point, right? The difference is that Friends was good, and all those other ones weren't. And so it's she was just there. It's it, it's you know she's she's not the crucial factor. Or you could flip it on your head and say, no, she was destined to be a star because she persevered through failed show after failed show, and every time these pilots were rejected, the one thing that stuck around was Jennifer Aniston, and so her talent was. The the one thing that was undeniable. And you can kind of go back and forth and it's like, we'll never know. Right. You know? Unless you were the girl who kept losing out to Jennifer Aniston on all of those things, just getting more and more frustrated being like, no, I am in the right place at the right time. And she keeps beating me. Damn you, Jennifer. <laughs> and so that's our thinking sort of going into these kinds of episodes is we want to kind of do a spotlight on this actor and just sort of see like what what the deal is basically and how they became or why they were such an inextricable part of this amazing show and this amazing character. And then what happened afterwards? You know, like I said, I tend to think of all of these actors, Matthew Perry, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, etc., as like, oh, they never quite lived up to that glory of the original show. And I think that's true to a certain extent, but Julia Louis-Dreyfus definitely comes damn close with say, Veep and all yeah. of her other stuff. And I I disagree in that she hasn't lived up to the brilliance of Seinfeld. I mean, Julia Louis-Dreyfus is a Mark Twain prize award-winning comedian. Like she's, yeah. and yes, it's due in part to her work on Seinfeld, but there are things and, you know, we've done a little bit of a deep dive on her in terms of some of our research for this. And she, like Aniston, was in a bunch of pilots between her time on SNL and her time when she got Seinfeld. She also was in a Woody Allen movie, Hannah and Her Sisters. Like she's, she was doing the thing. She, you know, she was out there working her ass off trying to, you know, get the next break. 
because she got into SNL at 21. Yeah. She was in college. She was doing Second City and her uh, boyfriend at the time, but her now husband, Brad Hall, had started this other comedy troupe called PTC. And she was she was discovered there. She and her husband, Brad, were both discovered there. They were hired as a couple. They weren't dating at the time. And so they were hired on SNL as a couple and just brought so much of the comedy that they've been doing at PTC to uh, SNL. In fact, one of the most hilarious sketches, if you ever want to see Julia Louis-Dreyfus in her like most absurd monologuiness, go check out It's called PTC, but it stands for People Talking Christ. And it's a a revival sketch that they do on SNL. And it's long form, I would say improv, because she's very clearly not reading cue cards when she's doing some of these bits. And um, her her character's name is April, May, June. And she's in this family and they're doing a revival. It's hilarious. Yeah. And of course, in her third and final year on SNL, she overlapped with Larry David. And that's how that relationship began. Um, Although she was up against some pretty heavy hitters um, for the role in Seinfeld. She was up against uh, Patricia Heaton, who went on to, um, she was the the mom on Home Improvement. And she was up against Mega Mullally, who is amazing and in many things, but Will and Grace, she was Karen and Will and Grace. So, you know, she, yes, she may have had a prior connection with Larry David just from that one season, but she still had to like stare down some talent in the room to get Elaine Bennis. She talks about in her WTF interview how she was, uh, Larry David remembered her from that time and they sent her those first four scripts of the Seinfeld Chronicles, they called it at the time. And yeah, like you said, I'm sure there were other actresses that they were considering, but she had this same dilemma that so many of these people have where she had a another show that she was slated to be on. And that would have been a bigger part because initially her role in Seinfeld wasn't that big, but she talks about reading those first four scripts and identifying that Larry David sensibility and that sense of humor and kind of going like, you know, I think this is the one to bet on, even if this other show that's a sure thing has a bigger part for me, I think ultimately Seinfeld's, you know, Seinfeld's the one to go with. This is funnier. <laughs> right. But so we do have, as always, a lineup. We did, you know, we're going to be talking about Ms. Dreyfus's whole sort of body of work, but we did specifically watch four sitcom episodes. So what did we watch? So we started out with Seinfeld and we went looking for one of Elaine's best episodes. And that episode is The Sponge. It's season seven, episode nine. And then we did the pilot of watching Ellie, which was her Seinfeld follow-up. And we did the pilot of The New Adventures of Old Christine, which was her, her next Seinfeld follow-up that was much more successful, ran for five seasons and won her an Emmy. And finally, we did the pilot of Veep. Yeah. So beginning with Seinfeld, it's our first time talking about Seinfeld on the podcast because it's not that tropey, you know, even though they go through some of the tropes, like they've got office parties and double dates and things like that. Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld had a very clear ethos of no hugs, no learning, right? They didn't want it to be cheesy. They wanted this to be a reaction to the growing pains, family ties, sort of treacly, sappy style that had really solidified throughout the 80s. And they said, we're not going to do that. So when we're looking for shows that go along with these dopey story tropes, Seinfeld doesn't come up that much. No. And when it does, and this is a thing that we have noticed is true about other ensemble shows, oftentimes, like when we watched Friends for the Doubles and Doppelgangers episode, it was a very tiny piece of the four different stories lines we were following. And that's true with Seinfeld as well. And so often there isn't one main storyline when we do come across these tropes. It's just, oh, it's mentioned because Kramer and, you know, Newman are getting up to something silly. And that's where the trope is handled. So it's in like the E plot or the D plot rather than the main storyline, which um, doesn't make it as much fun for us when we're doing all the comparisons. Yeah. And I have to admit, when we turned this on and started this episode, 
it was the first time since we've been doing the podcast that I kind of felt this little sense of panic. Like, I don't know if we're going to have anything to say about this. You know, those first <laughs> few scenes just kind of happen. And there weren't, like, it's really good. Part of it is that I loved Seinfeld. And I've seen every episode at least four times. It's just one of those, I went through the whole series, you know, when it came out and when it was on DVD and when it was on Netflix. And so I'm just so familiar with it. And I think because it's from our formative years, you don't have those things of, oh my God, look at his hair. Oh my God, look at what he's wearing. You know, you don't have the super dopey, tropes like we were talking about it's just kind of a pretty good smart comedy and there's not a lot to pick at you know what i mean yeah well that's because there's not a lot going on right i mean famously it's the show about nothing this one opens as so many of them do they're sitting in the diner they're talking and having these conversations and little you know like you're talking with your friends and from that conversation several things come up and then those things go on throughout the episode they drop in like little, you know, like little beads, like little, they're, they're planting little seeds in that first, uh, in that first scene. So there's the little, you know, through line of Jerry, he changes the number in his pants from 32 to 31. So he can say he's still the same size as he was in college, yeah. even though he's not, and he's changing it by the, you know, one, whatever, um, one size. And so Elaine like randomly asks him, Hey, are you still a 31? Cause she's going to like get him some pants or something. And he's like, yep. Same size as I was in college, which then becomes this thing that George shares with Susan, his fiance. Right. And there's a larger story about Jerry got a woman's number, phone number off the AIDS walk thing. Uh, right. But what I want to talk about with that is how it plays in with George and Susan, because their story is all about this idea that once you're a serious couple, you've got this sort of confidentiality clause thing where... Well, it's a it's like non-confidentiality, right. right? Like all of your friends assume if they tell you something, you tell your partner. Yeah. Which, uh, what do we think about that? Because I thought this was a very interesting So dilemma. I want to know what you think about that. Because well, it's funny. <laughs> The, the problem we usually have is the opposite. The problem we have is you telling my friends secrets about me. That, you, <laughs> that they already know. <laughs> I, I'm more concerned with what you're going to say to them. Right. Not, not that. I don't. I. <laughs> Right, because I have less of like a privacy filter about things about myself that are like other people would think are embarrassing. I'm like, whatever, that's just life. That's who we are. And and also like awkward kind of things like I, I just don't I don't tend to think of those kinds of things as like private or awkward or whatever. For example, um, like if you said about a friend, like, oh yeah, you know, that's the one who, you know, who stubbed his toe two days ago, I'd be like, oh, hey, Rosie, heard you stubbed your your toe two days ago. Are you still limping? And Jay would be like, why did you tell him we were talking about him? Yes. Perfect example. <laughs> Ripped from the headlines. <laughs> I um, mean, look, I'm not going to use a real example. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I think, uh, I think this is true. In the sense that, for the most part, when you do confide in a friend about some personal matter and you sort of trust that they're going to keep it to themselves and not tell anyone, I think in most cases you just sort of accept, yeah, they'll probably tell their wife or yeah, you know, and it's just sort of okay. And I think, I don't know, on a case-by-case -case basis, I think there are certain things that people would tell me that I would just know intuitively, I'm not even going to tell you. I'm just going to keep that totally to myself, take it to the grave. I think those are the exceptions. I think for the most part, it's sort of accepted that, yeah, the person's going to tell their spouse, but hopefully 
what doesn't happen is the next step in this chain reaction, which right. is, of course, that that person then goes and tells everyone else and it spirals out of control. I think in real life, the hope is that, yeah, they might tell their spouse, but then that's where it ends. Well, and I think Susan, I think she violates that agreement, right? Yes. Like over and over again, because she's the one who's telling George, well, duh, everyone just assumes you tell me, you have to tell me these things. That's like, you have to, that's, it's, it's assumed and I want to know and whatever. But then she does. She goes and gossips and tells other people who, you know, through the the chain, like the phone chain, it gets back to this woman that Jerry's dating, that he got her phone number off of this AIDS walk list that Kramer was signing people up because he was trying to raise money for his AIDS walk. And so, yeah, it was like Susan violated the her side of the agreement. Like, yes, your spouse or your partner or whatever, it's assumed is going to tell you things. But then that also assumes you take on the confidentiality of the friendship bond. Yes. Like you only know because you're dating this person and that person knows because they're friends with that person. So you have to uphold the same friendship agreement. Yeah, exactly. So Jerry's sort of nightmare fantasy that one by one the secret is going to be passed on is ultimately completely realized. So he yells at George and says, you're out of the loop. Right. But so that's their story. The other thing that gets set up in this initial diner scene is, of course, that Elaine's favorite contraceptive, the sponge, is going off the market. So that's going to be her story. And arguably the main story of this episode is her favorite contraceptive is off the market. She finds this one store that's still selling it. So you get this great, you know, easily top 10 Elaine moments ever, right? Where she's talking to the clerk. He says, we only have one box left. Uh, we have a case. Yeah, a 60 come in a case. And so she's doing that escalation of, okay, well, give me three. You know, three? Okay, yeah, yeah, just five. Five will be fine. Okay, five? Yeah, yeah, like I said, just 10. Yeah, yeah, 15 will be five. And then, yeah, and it keeps going, yeah, just give me the whole case. And so now she's got these 60 uh, sponges that she has to ration for basically the rest of her life. Yeah, and that's what that's her argument. She's like, these have to last me the rest of my life. So, and I only have 60 of them. And so now people have to, it has to be determined whether or not they're sponge worthy. And she happens to be dating Luke from Gilmore Girls. She's got out on a few dates with him. And so she's trying to decide if he's sponge worthy. And she, it seems, has made her decision that he is sponge worthy. And then George comes knocking because they're making out on the couch. And then George comes knocking on her door because he and Susan have had this fight about the confidentiality and he's given her some more gossip. So now she wants to have makeup sex. And it turns out she also uses the Today Sponge and she's out. So he goes over to Elaine's place to see if he could borrow one of hers and she turns them away because they're a precious commodity. Yeah. So as we were watching all of this, I really started noticing what Julia Louis-Dreyfus's sort of superpowers are and what really make her special that I hadn't totally put my finger on. And one of them is the way she's really great at sort of vacillating between high and low status in any given situation. And her sort of natural instrument, as they say, you know, her, her body and her voice can be very sophisticated and sort of, you know, can have an air of authority about it. Yeah, you know, she's a billionaire. Her dad is a French billionaire. So she grew up, she went to boarding school. She's all of the, like, she absolutely has that uh, privilege going yeah. behind her. And you can tell when you listen to her speaking in an interview as herself, it's similar to Sigourney Weaver. I would say she just has her voice is just a little bit deeper, still perfectly ladylike, but she just has that that kind of college professor kind of vibe to her that she can really deploy. And so you see how she would be cast as the president, or you see how in this little circle of Seinfeld friends, she's always the one that's the closest to having a legit job and being part of legit society. But at the same time, 
she's so good at showing you that veneer start to crack and showing the desperation or the exasperation start to shine through. And so scenes like this or scenarios like this are so perfect for her when she's sizing the guy up sort of like it's a job interview and she's kind of stroking her chin and looking him up and down and going, you're going to do something about those sideburns. Uh, And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll do something about the sideburns. I'm sorry. You know, she's so good at that. And then on the flip side, in a situation where she's trying to keep her cool with the pharmacist, but you know, it can't really contain the fact that she desperately wants all the sponges. She's just so perfect at that. And so I just really saw how much of an asset she is in that kind of ensemble. Well, and you're going to see that same that same line that you're talking about where cuz she, you know, she does play kind of uh, uh, frenetic kind of characters that are just like holding on to what they have by the you know, the skin of their teeth. You know right. what I mean? Like she plays that in Veep and in um, New Adventures of Old Christine to a T. And I think in watching Ellie, we get pieces of it, but that what they were going for in watching Ellie was something very different from Elaine. They made her sexy. She yes. was, it was, I mean, the whole pilot, she is walking around in a bra with her shirt open like it is on purpose a total departure from Elaine and so I think that that what you're talking about that special magic it it could be that they were worried that was too much like Elaine yeah. and that she hadn't really found a way to translate that thing that she does into these other characters yet yeah well a couple things I think just like you said She's so often playing characters who are on the periphery of elitism or sophistication. You know, the vice president is a perfect example. It's one of these so close yet so far away. Like she's kind of one of the most powerful and respected people in the world. And she's also kind of a laughing stock, you know, and New Adventures of Old Christine is all about how she's trying to sort of fit into this elite station and not quite. And again, in Seinfeld, she's sort of part of this group of misfits that's on the edge of becoming something more and, you know, part of being on the board of this publishing company or whatever, but can't quite get there. And yeah. And the second thing is you talked about how they, they try to sex her up in the next show. And that's also something very interesting about her specifically, well, all the time, but especially in this Seinfeld days where her, for lack of a better word, her level of hotness is just so perfect, you know, because she's not, you totally buy her as someone who has this active sex life and has all these different men that are interested in her and all of that kind of stuff and living this sort of swinging single lifestyle. And yet not like attracting all the men in her group of friends in a way that makes it so that she can't have them as friends. Right, And also not making it so that you, the viewer are too busy drooling over her to see how funny she is. You know, it's something that comes so effortlessly. You think of Jerry Seinfeld, perfect example, right? No girl in the nineties had Jerry Seinfeld up on her wall as some kind of hunk that they wanted to sleep with, but you accept it that he's a single guy and all these women are going out with him. He's just like this normal, grown-up metropolitan guy. Right. And Julia Louis-Dreyfus has that perfectly, where she's kind of distinct and funny looking and odd and interesting, but she's also sexy. And she just, you, you get that a lot less with women. Like you look at the Friends women, for example, and they're all sexy, but they all had to be like hot. Right. You know, and well, she's and there's different. that choice, right? That was part of the show was to like have them going braless all the time and make the studio really cold. So we're seeing their nipples through most of the episode. Like those are all things that are done on purpose. Whereas I is that why I liked Friends so much? I never thought. I <laughs> never thought about it. <laughs> um, so Julia Louis Dreyfus gave the best answer to. She was asked why she never does nude scenes, and she said. I was never asked, which bullshit, but also fucking great answer. You know what I mean? Of course, of course, people wanted her to do that. She either had really good management that didn't bring it to her or she had already just told them I'm not, you know, not interested. So they declined on her behalf or whatever. But like, I think that was just like, 
I was never asked. But I think about her in Veep, all of those, you know, like Donna Karen, uh, Ann Taylor, like skin tight dresses that she's wearing. Like she looks gorgeous. She's super hot. You know what I mean? And has always been super hot. Look back at SNL when she was basically a teenager. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like she's beautiful and, and, oh, and always has been. But she definitely like it was the time in the nineties of the bigger shoulder pads and everything was a little bit more covered up, but they could have taken it a different direction and they didn't. And, and it was an, it was an absolute choice and I'm glad they did. Yeah, totally. So yeah, I'm starting to notice those things about her that really make her so invaluable to these shows. Now also this concept of sponge worthiness is just such a perfect Seinfeld idea. You know, it's this sort of slightly absurd take on this phenomenon of the way people size each other up when dating. And also this slightly absurd take on the way our priorities shift over time. And it's like, isn't it funny how you start out like sex, 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 that's the prima facie priority above everything. And then eventually you start getting into the like, yeah, but I really wanted to, you know, I, I don't, those other little things start getting in the way in these sort of comical ways. And that sort of rejiggering of priorities, I think is where a lot of the humor in Seinfeld comes from. Yeah. It was uh, that whole there were a couple different scenes, right? There was the scene where she was telling the guys about how she needed to have this sponge worthiness test now because she only had the 60. And um, and then she decides after she has that whole conversation, that next scene that you were talking about where she's sitting there with the uh, Luke from the Gilmore Girls and telling him he needs to change his sideburns and have you done something about have you cleaned your bathroom and, you know, and all that. And she decides that he is sponge worthy. And so then the next scene is them the next morning in bed and, uh, you know, he's waking up and he's like, hey, let's go again. And she's like, uh, you know, well, first he was like, oh, did you have fun? You know, did you regret using a sponge and whatever? And she was like, oh, no, it was great. Yeah, this was wonderful. Thanks. And then and then he's like, all right, let's go again. And she was like, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. You're not a two sponger. Yeah. Uh <laughs> Yeah. No, it's just really funny how, you know, just how she's so sort of clinical about it. And yeah, you know, it's Seinfeld. All the different stories are swarming around. Kramer's got this thing going on where he's he's participating in the AIDS walk, but he's staying up all night playing poker. So a couple a couple little things about those those other storylines. Um, well, the Today Sponge storyline is is real. The the Today Sponge was pulled off the market at that time in 1995. So that was what where the idea from for the show came from. And then or for that one. And then also the AIDS walk thing, Kramer's whole deal is that people wear ribbons, but they don't actually do anything. So he's going to do something. He's going to do this AIDS walk. And that storyline came because the crew were told when they went to the Emmys that they had to wear red ribbons. And they were like, well, like, we don't have to. I mean, it's not that we don't support AIDS. It's that, like, we will do, like, we give money. We don't need to wear a ribbon, like, totally, whatever. Total Larry David scenario. You yes. can totally imagine him going, you know. You can't make me wear ribbon. a ribbon. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So that was where that storyline came from. And then the bullies, um, bully, you know, like, they beat Kramer up on the AIDS walk because he's in the AIDS walk not wearing a ribbon. But so... That's pretty much it for this episode of Seinfeld, right? That sort of gives us our taste of Elaine. You know, we all we all remember Seinfeld, right? We don't really we don't need anything to, you know, prove how great she was on that. And then Seinfeld ends, and like you said, a few years later we get watching Ellie. Yeah. So Seinfeld ends in ninety eight, and then two thousand two, watching Ellie debuts. This one was hard to watch, largely for the reason that pure availability limited us to a YouTube version that was really hard to see, yeah. right? So we had the tracking lines from like the old VCR. <laughs> yeah. So that was part of it. You know, we've we've had to watch some uh, sort of janky editions of some of these shows that aren't on the streamers. This was probably the hardest one. 
just on that level. But it's it's not just that, right? This show is hard to get a handle on. You already kind of explained it, but what's what's the concept of this show? So the concept of watching Ellie is it is a single camera show. It is shot in 22 minutes. Like it runs in real time. In fact, the NBC execs asked to have the 22 minute countdown timer on the screen because they wanted to make, they wanted, they were trying to explain away the fact that we get a bunch of scenes of her like walking down the street or running to the neighbors. And so you get trans, like the transitions all happen in real time. So when she's going from her apartment to her gig, she's a jazz singer. She's like a nightclub singer in the show. That's her character. And she goes from her apartment to the club and she's saying it's only a block away when she gets there, but we have to watch the entire walk. And so that's like, you know, four or five minutes of your episode is this walk from her apartment. And so I think one of the reasons they wanted to have that countdown timer on there was to show, no, this, we're, like we shot this in real time or we, you know, this is, we're showing you this in real time. It's it's a show in 22 minutes, about 22 minutes in Ellie's life. Yes, that's exactly the right impulse. We also learned that the original title of the show was 22 minutes. Right. They should have kept that. What I would say is that this show needs something up front to contextualize what you're watching. Because, yeah, just like you said, you watch it and you just don't really get it. It looks like it might be some sort of Truman Show type thing where it's like, this is surveillance footage that we're we're watching this person. Like, it just, to me anyway, I didn't understand what the concept was and the whole rhythm of it is odd. And if it was called 22 minutes or even better, if there was something up front, even if it was just as simple as like the following is 22 minutes in the life of jazz singer Ellie so-and-so, something to make us go, oh, okay, I get it. Because as it is, you're just sort of watching this chaos. You're seeing this timer in the corner and you're just like, what is this? Well, so I watched Watching Ellie. I watched the first season. I liked that that premise of it happening in the 22 minutes. And all of the marketing did tell you that. In fact, the like logo for the show has the clock in it, not the digital clock, but an analog clock. So it's like watching yes. Ellie, the words are kind of on top of yep. this clock and the clock starts and that's when you know the episode starts and then they put up the timer in the corner. Look, the timer in the corner is neither here nor there once you understand the premise. But if you don't know what the premise is, then yeah, it is a little confusing because she never seems to leave her apartment. Like we're over halfway through the show and she's just had a series of unfortunate events that are happening in her apartment. And she runs down to like her toilet is overflowing. So she's trying to get ready for her gig. She was on the phone with her sister. She hangs up with her sister. She runs down to get the the super, the super comes up. So you've got all of this, like her running down the stairs because the, um, you know, the elevator's broken or her neighbor tells her the elevator's broken. Now in this show, different from Seinfeld, every man that she interacts with, her land or her super, the superintendent of her building, her neighbor, that's a doctor that turns out to be a veterinarian and her other neighbor that tells her the elevator's broken, her manager who she meets at the club, and randomly on the street, her ex-boyfriend who's like stalking her as she goes from work to or from home to work. Every man we meet in this episode is obsessed with Ellie. The superintendent like hits his head on the toilet because he's trying to like peek at her changing instead of fixing the toilet. The doctor neighbor comes over and we find out that he's a veterinarian, but Ellie doesn't know that because he's just told her he's a doctor. As she's running to take the, to leave, she finds out that the elevator isn't broken. And we find out that the, her other neighbor who told her the elevator's broken, it's because he wants to like walk with her down the stairs and spend time with her. Like, everyone in her world is wanting to fuck her. Yeah. Almost like they live in a universe that was written by her husband. And right? they do. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to say between that and the full two or three minute music performance we get at the end, it comes across as vanity a little bit. It comes across as a much less self-deprecating 
angle and it's more like you know yeah if i got to be the doofus with the weird dancing that was always falling on my face and making a fool of myself then maybe this time i can be a little more sexy and in control of myself and look don't get me wrong she's still all harried and crazy and running around and you know yeah we still get her comedy like we totally there's good you know steve carell plays her ex-boyfriend edgar they have great chemistry the the fight that they have on the street that is like walking i mean she in this reminds me of liz lemon totally like this is liz lemon could have been based on this watching ellie character yeah i would say that's i i felt that about this and the next character but definitely the other thing about this show i think just sort of thinking about the context of when it came out 2002 right so the office, the British office started in 2000 and Curb Your Enthusiasm started in 2000 or 2001. But I think this show wears those influences on its sleeve. You know, I think I'm not saying they're totally biting off those concepts, but especially Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah, they said they were heavily influenced by the Larry Sanders show. Sure. That's another one. There's a certain look at that time because the, you know, really nice HD video stuff hadn't come out yet. So these kind of shows where you're following somebody around with a video camera just don't really look nice. And I think The Office and Curb Your Enthusiasm both had these really singular, interesting voices to them coming from Ricky Gervais and Stephen Merchant and Larry David, respectively. And no offense to Brad, what's his face? Brad Hall. This just doesn't have that, you know? Well, and it definitely doesn't in the pilot. And I and I totally see where you're coming from, where you're saying, oh, this is, a, you know, this, it comes across as vanity. The last minute, 30 seconds is Julia Louis-Dreyfus standing on a stage singing. Did we know she could sing? Probably not. The first 10 minutes, if not more, is her in a bra. So like, yes, we're trying to go for some different, for some different things here. Absolutely can see how you, how you could go the vanity route. But I think if we get past the pilot, if we watched a few more episodes, I remember liking this show and being annoyed that every you know everyone was saying oh no this show has got you know this show isn't good nobody likes it it's another seinfeld curse and da da da, da. like again this was 2002 i was i had just graduated from college i had a tivo and i was recording and never missing an episode you know i was like an early adopter of the dvr back in the tivo days and so i never missed one and i I thought that this was really good. Now, I am a sucker for any time that there's music in a a sitcom. So there's that. But I didn't, you know, I didn't know Steve Carell. I don't think at that time, like he maybe had been doing a little bit on The Daily Show by then, like the Stephen versus Stephen. Daily Show or Dana Carvey Show, sure, but not not a brand name. Right. No, I knew him as, if I knew him at all, I knew him as the guy from as the guy from The Daily Show. Like, this is before Anchorman, right? This is before any of that stuff. So that in and of itself, seeing him get to act with Julia Louis-Dreyfus was great. And then the second season, all of the complaints that you're talking about, about the premise and the 22 minutes were completely echoed in the network execs, uh, you know, the the men upstairs, and they retooled the whole show. I know, which is so weird. This is another empty nest situation where you take the wrong lessons from the complaints, you know, like my complaint isn't necessarily that that's a bad idea. It's that it's confusing and they didn't make it clear enough, but it still was basically the only thing it had going for it. If you take that away, then it's just a show about a lady. You and know? that is what happened. They took it away. They made it into a traditional multi-camera sitcom. It went from being sort of dark and shaky and having lots of um, kind of crazy, silly moments happening in real time to your standard, very bright, flat, big set pause for laughs even they even had a laugh track on the second season the second season ran even fewer episodes than the first season so the first season there were three unaired episodes they shot you know like 
15 or something and they ended up only airing like 12 and then second season only had like six episodes. Yeah. So it does seem to me like a little bit of a sort of, I don't want to say a footnote, but you know, part of that trend of those early 2000s sort of handheld, vaguely documentary style sitcoms, like, Hey, this is the new thing, you know, that, oh, that, you know, that's, they're doing that. Let's let's try to do our version of that. And it wasn't too long after that, right? Because this was the 02, 03 season. And then, so it ran for two seasons. It ended in 03. And then it was three years later and we get The New Adventures of Old Christine. The New Adventures of Old Christine. Season one, episode one. It's funny that you said Tina Fey about watching Ellie, because that was my first note about this, right? The episode begins with her waking up and doing a sort of note to self kind of thing. And to me, it has that same energy of just, you know, that sort of modern early 2000s woman who knows what functionality looks like and is almost there, but we're getting to see that behind the scenes sort of craziness, like she doesn't quite have it all together. And just that vibe to me was a very Liz Lemon vibe. Yeah. I I mean, Liz Lemon, if she was a single mother. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So... New Adventures of Old Christine, some amazing talent packed into this cast, right? We have main characters, obviously, Julia Louis-Dreyfus. She is Old Christine. Then you have her ex-husband, played by Clark Gregg. Right. Clark Gregg. amazing. He's this great actor. A lot of people know him as... From from the Iron Man and the first Avengers movie, Agent Coulson, Phil Coulson. Right. And he's so good in that as like the one sort of random schlub from the bureaucracy. And he's actually sort of secretly one of the most interesting actors in the movie. But he's got a whole legit theater career and he's yeah, really he's good. A, he's a Sorkin player. I mean, he turns up in anything and everything Aaron Sorkin has ever done. He kind of rounds out the end of Sports Night. Uh, he comes in and plays a couple different characters, I think, in The West Wing. He's, he's fabulous. He's just such a great actor. And we get his sort of bumble like he he plays like the average failing forward white man so well and that's what he does in this he's like this sort of kind of bumbling guy that just is like oh i don't really have to care about anything success just comes to me whatever we're not married anymore i'm gonna go date a new christine she's a lot younger than you whatever like yeah It's sort of ironic because he is such an amazing actor, but he is very good at coming across as a guy who is not special, who is like, why the hell would any woman care about this guy? Right, right. Well, and I think Julia Louis-Dreyfus kind of has that sort of similar thing, right? Like she can be very commanding, like you were saying, but she absolutely knows how to play these like harried women and does them so well. (laughs) And you have Hamish Linklater as her brother. He was, we were talking about this morning, he was an indie it boy at this time in the early 2000s. He was just one of those guys that started showing up in indie movies and small parts and TV shows and stuff. This sort of lanky, uh, again, has this kind of intellectual, sort of a hipster uh, vibe to him. And it is sort of Perfect casting to have him as her brother, who's sort of like the angel on her shoulder in the sense of a big part of the show is about her sort of inching into this world of elitist, well-to-do white people and him being this sort of voice of, uh, you know, uh, that's maybe that's not such a great idea. And yeah, maybe that lot- isn't what you want to aspire to. And and she does. She has that balance, right? Like, and and her son, her kid. Uh, I mean, he's supposed to be in third grade. He walks in to class on the first day. She's gotten him into this really swanky private school. She feels really good about it because she's like, I'm a single mom. I own a business. I've got to do right by my kid. You know, my half the time he's being raised by my brother, who's kind of this you know, fallen on hard times artist. 
Hamish Linkletter in this reminds me of a less wacky Spencer from iCarly. Definitely. He's got that kind of um, one-liner energy. Yes, give us the movie where Jerry Trainer from iCarly and Hamish Linkletter are brothers, you oh. know, con men or something. I would oh, watch that, that over and over and over again. Uh, yeah, they like he he's got that kind of he's always kind of carrying coffee and just has like you know, do you really want to da 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 da, Christine? you know, that kind of attitude. Well, so anyway, her, she and her son walk into the class on the, on the first day of school and her third grader looks up at her and was like, mom, where are all the black people? Cause he's moved from a public school to a private school. And she's like, shh, don't say that. I mean, yes, but well, there was one in the brochure. Ah. Exactly. So Hamish Linkladder's character is representing that same impulse that the kid has, that we're moving into this hoity toity society that does not reflect our values and is kind of shitty for whatever reason. And she, of course, is grasping, right? Because it's a classic Julia Louis-Dreyfus character. She wants to be in that upper station. And you see her using all of those superpowers. The scene where she's talking to the kid and trying to sell it, trying to sort of keep that air of positivity and, you know, have the way you talk down to little kids while, you know, he's 10 steps ahead of her and he knows all the reasons why this is not going to be a good time for him. And her exasperation, you know, perfect sort of JLD character. And then again, when she meets the other moms in the school and she's got to keep up that, you know, she's, she's got to try to fit in with them basically. Right. And And they're like, Oh, we hear that you work. Yeah. What is that like? Right. Exactly. And so she has to keep that smiling sort of posturing, you know, no, I'm one of you, you know, please accept me. And that's, that's where Julia Louis-Dreyfus lives. Like right. that's what she's so good at. We get a great moment with her and the teacher. So she notices on the first day of school, everyone is bringing in these presents for the teacher. And the teacher has this cart just filled with flowers and plants and, you know, little things and stuff that are these gifts. That's the first day of school present. And she didn't know she needed to bring something. She didn't bring anything. So she's like, okay, I'm going to go lie to the teacher. Uh, So she goes up there and she's just like, I'm so sorry. Your present was delayed. And it was so big that they had to ship it. And And the teacher totally sees this for what it is and throws her a bone and is like, I've noticed that the bigger the present, the, you know, kid's a pain in the butt, the bigger the jerk or whatever the kid is. And she's like, oh, God, thank you so much. You know, like working woman to working woman, uh, you know, feels her. This is one of several times where we see... Christine lie terribly, right? She's lying all the time and she's terrible at it, which makes it a little cartoonish because she lies in such a way. It's like watching the Pinocchio cartoon for little kids. It's so obvious and it's impossible to believe a 10 year old kid would be better at lying than this fully grown woman. Woman. So in that sense, (laughs) it's unbelievable, but it's very funny and They do address it in the show because one of her other lies comes when we get the sort of major plot point of this episode and the sort of premise of the whole show, which is her finding out that her ex-husband, Clark Gregg, has a new girlfriend who's also named Christine. And she's going to pretend that she has a new boyfriend named Joe. And we get another one of these, you know, she's really good at showing you the thought process, uh, taking you along for that ride of all of the weird ups and downs going on inside of her brain. So when she's making up Joe, the boyfriend, it's an absolutely idiotic lie, but it's fun to see her try to sell it and try to come up with it. And she is now in, you know, she's now at a place in her career where the people who are directing the shows that she's in 
know what she's good at. Yeah. So they're not doing like a two shot when we get to see this lie happen. They're squarely on her. She's framed in the car window because she's come upon Clark Gregg and new Christine in the car in the parking lot of little Richie's new school. And they're, you know, making out a little bit. And she's like, what the hell? And when we get this lie scene, you know, so we've got the, the shot that's kind of through the windshield to see the two of them and then the shot that's through the other window like the passenger side window looking across so we can see both of them kind of looking at Christine and then when we get the lie it's just like tight in on her we don't need to see any reaction from any of the other characters because what we really want to focus on is that thought process and so it's I think to your point about is it talent is it luck is it timing what is it at a certain point when when you're good at something and people have seen you be good at something over and over and over again, you start to like develop a community around you that will allow you to do that thing. And I think that's what we have here. And I think that's why new Christine hit in the way that it did. It's funny you say that because I completely agree. And yet I, I look at it from the other angle of that's, that's why it could succeed, but also why it could never succeed on the level of Seinfeld because it's a completely different ratio. What you're saying about the way they shot it is true, but also just on a script level and on a concept level, we're getting a whole scenario that's built around, it's funny to watch her lie. It's funny to watch her struggle. And those things are funny, so it's good. But now it's gone from being one part of this overall world that Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld created and one ingredient in that. And now we've got the sort of whoops all marshmallows version of the Captain Crunch. You know, we've got now it's all Julia Louis Dreyfus all the time. It's just, you know, look, if Elaine was absolutely your favorite part of Seinfeld, then you might love this. No, you're, and I think you're onto something there. And I think it has to do with Seinfeld, Friends, Cheers, all of these wonderful ensemble shows that became this amazing thing, Will and Grace, all of them, they were all relatively unknown. So there wasn't a star. There wasn't somebody who's, you know, list of followers people were signing, you know, or they were getting the contract to do. That changes. And you have to, like, as an actor, go along with that, because she's never going to get to go back and be unknown again. You know, she can never do a show where she isn't the star or the, oh, isn't it funny? We've got Betty White in this one, you know, as the character actor on the side. Like, it's never going to be that way again because you only get that one time. But that's the part where I think the different actors' approaches to their career come into play because, yes, it's true. You can't go back to being unknown. But what you can do is say – I'm not going to make it a priority to keep making the same amount of money that I did when I was on my series or, or maintain that same amount of fame as I did when I was on my series. So for example, I think I brought this up in one of our other podcasts, Jennifer Aniston doing office space, right? Understanding I was making a million dollars an episode on friends and it was the most popular sitcom in the world. You can't say anything like that about this office space thing. It's, It's a small role. It's like seventh on the call sheet. But I just got a feeling about this. And this is going to be a good movie. And this will be a good move for me. This will be funny. And I want to do it. Or maybe she was just doing a favor for a friend. The money thing, though, is something to think about. Because one of the reasons all the networks originally passed on watching Ellie was both Julie Louis-Dreyfus and her husband, Brad Hall, who is the creator of the show, were making $350,000 an episode. They were asking for that big money price tag because they were big money stars. And that's one of the reasons that studios and networks were like, no thanks, we're not interested. And for that kind of money, you better be bringing in a surefire hit. And it was yeah. not. And even that was a pay cut from them for, for them from friends, for right. Elaine, not for, for the other yeah. And Matthew Perry has the same story with his post-Friends career, you know, that they had to have this weird compromise where he's like, I'm only asking for 2% of what I was making on that thing. And yet it still is like an unheard of 
uh, fee, that's what happens when they negotiate these million dollar an episode deals. It's like there's nowhere to go from there. Well, and it, it, it's because they are critical to the show, not the other way around, right? Like the, they aren't the thing that made the show big. It was the the fact that it was the chemistry all together. And so they have to have them there. So one of the things, though, about New Christine and the reason I think this show works is that similarly to what I was saying about the community, you know, you've got a community around you as an actor who now knows, like, lets you do your thing and and knows how to shoot you and will support you and can write for you that way or will listen to your ideas when you're like, no, I want to try this. Similarly, in the actual show of New Christine, she has this like grasping and she's a bad liar and she's still trying to lie all the time. And all of these things could add up to being a very unlikable person. But everyone, including her ex-husband, still just cares about her. She's a good person who's trying really hard and trying really hard in ways that maybe don't always work out, but her heart is in the right place. And that's why you see, and we haven't even mentioned the other heavy hitter, her best friend, who is at the uh, office with her all the time, who's like her co-owner of the workout, Jim, is Wanda Sykes. Was she in this episode? She was not in okay. the pilot. I was going to say, did I not notice Wanda Sykes? She was not in the pilot, but she's a major character in this. And- to the point of where are all the black people, what the kid asks in that first like that first scene at yeah. the school, where are all the wow. black people in the show? Yeah. We've got say, Wanda Sykes yeah. coming in after this you could say first that about episode. The entire TV lineup of all these shows in the 90s. But uh, yeah, I want to hang on what you said about the heart because – The show has a lot of that, right? When I found myself tearing up at the end of the show as she's sending the little boy off to school and he's telling her that he had a good day and she's, you know, on the verge of tears because he's actually getting along in his new school. It's very, very clear we're not in Seinfeld anymore. (laughs) You know, that whole mentality that they had of no sentiment, no hugs, no learning. That's not what this is. This is more like Friends, where we're going to have a few laughs and we're going to, you know, we can make some rude jokes to each other. But at the end of the day, this is a feel good show. And the premise, you know, uh, I, I related to this premise is it's about a divorced couple who still get along, you know, and my parents are split up and still have that kind of relationship where they're still in touch with each other and get together for the holidays and stuff. And what this whole show is about is them them having that situation and being on sort of equal ground at the beginning and then her finding out that there is this new Christine and her ex now has this new girlfriend. And so now they're not equal anymore. And it's like their divorce has moved into this new phase where now she's the one who's still single. And it's like this new level of indignity, which again, a very sort of Liz Lemon, very sort of Kathy from the comic strips kind of situation, you know? Yeah. She has this scene or she, she has a scene with Clark Gregg where he comes to her office to be like, hey, you know, sorry you had to find out that way, like catching me making out with my new Christine in the parking lot. Um, are you OK? And she, you know, she owns like she owns up to lying and he and he has that like straight face like, oh, it's so hard to tell when you're lying, you know, thing. And so she owns up to lying and then they, you know, they have a nice little conversation or whatever. And what's really what I really like about this once again is that they aren't trying to do anything. They aren't trying to have sexual chemistry between the two of them. They very much are going for it like this is a co-parenting situation where there's an absolute reason that they got divorced yeah. and they are very happy in the fact that they are no longer married, but they also like each other as human beings and think of each other as good parents and are happy and okay with the co-parenting situation. And so new Christine comes in and she's like, hey, just want to check in on this though. Because you two seem to spend an awful lot of time together. 
are we okay? Like, are there any lingering feelings? Yeah. <laughs> is this all right? And they're like, no, it's fine. And so, you know, that's good. And that this is the pilot. So it sets up the whole dynamic going forward of Christine. She says to Clark Gregg in that scene, she's like, I am still wearing my maternity underwear. You know, she has been in this marriage or that relationship for so long. They've been divorced now two years. And there's sort of that like, uh, figuring out who you are process that happens. And for her, she's just like, she just leaned fully into mom. She's like, I'm, I'm a mom and I run a business and that's all I have the space in my head for. But now my husband or my ex-husband is dating. I, I have to do that. Like I have to not just like wall these things off. And so the end of the episode, she's throwing her maternity underwear out into the garbage outside, like one piece at a time and saying goodbye to it. <laughs> and her brother Hamish Linkletter comes out with his coffee and has a few more one-liners. Yeah. And I also think the casting and the characterization of new Christine is very sort of humane, you know, because they make her, she's younger and she's, you know, very attractive, but she's, it's not like Ayuga casting, you know, it's right. not meant to be like, oh my God, he found some underwear model and she's just some sort of super sexy bimbo. They make no, she's it. She's a totally normal woman who is younger and attractive and would date Clark Gregg, exactly. who is an older balding man. Yeah, exactly. So it really sets the tone for this series that, yeah, it is going to be, it's going to be a showcase for JLD to do her stuff and give us lots of exasperation and lots of weird posturing and trying to convince people of things and trying to put things over on her kid and the teachers and everything. But it's also going to be a relatively grounded world and a sort of, you know, something about a family that has some warmth to it. Do you think that this is Elaine Bennis who moved to the suburbs and got married 15 years later? Yeah, I think that's the sort of that's the sort of best case scenario for her, not the divorce per se, but the overall characterization of her is like, yeah, she's still a little bit of a goof, but you know, she's a good mom and she more or less has her act together. Sure, I don't see let's put it this way. Again, the the world view of Seinfeld is much more darker and misanthropic. So that filters into to the characters. So if you say, well, is there a difference between Elaine and Christine? I would say, yeah, there's a little bit of a darkness to Elaine that isn't there in Christine because of those two different creators, but you could also say, yeah, she grew out of it, you know, five, 10 years later. Yeah. You know, she's not, she's not wearing the, the dark lipstick anymore. You know, she doesn't have that edge because she you grew have up. You such a hate for that, like 90s I don't like that brown look. red lipstick. Yeah, I don't like that look. <laughs> don't say that around my friend Audra. She wears it all the time. All right. I apologize. <laughs> well, so we can't leave off on uh, New Adventures of Old Christine until we mention that this is the one that she won an Emmy for. And in her acceptance speech, she says, I'm not somebody who really believes in curses, but curse this baby. Nice. Because she won the Emmy and broke the curse. All right. So this goes on for how many seasons? This was five seasons. It ran 2005, 2006, now 2006 to 2010. Okay. So I think... Objectively, you would say that's a success. If you stay on the air for that long, again, I don't think it has the cultural footprint, obviously, that Seinfeld does. For me personally, you know, we're, we're anytime we talk about a pilot, we're keeping in mind, like we're grading on a curve. All these things kind of find their footing afterwards, you know? Um, so yeah, in, in my view, I totally got why it, why people would like it, but it was a little unremarkable in the sense that it didn't have, it just didn't have that interesting voice oh, that it, Seinfeld does. It's just another sitcom. Right. Right. If you like Julia Louis-Dreyfus, watch her be in this sitcom. And, and it is, and it's good. And thankfully there are, 
this wonderful cast of characters around her as the seasons went on the little kid the the son obviously got older and he was very funny as well like as he got into his preteen years he would join in with the with the one liners with uh, Hamish Linkletter so yeah it was i mean it, it was a good show it had good actors it was fun to watch i was a fan of this show but Absolutely. It was just another sitcom. But so I say that sort of in contrast to the next and final show we're going to talk about, Veep. So we watched the pilot of Veep. Veep is a juggernaut in certain circles, right? It's a political satire. She uh, plays the vice president of the United States for spoilers, most of the show. And it runs from 2012 to 2019, although there was a break in there because she had breast cancer. Yeah. And this is the brainchild of Armando Iannucci, who I remember when he sort of came on the scene with this movie in the loop. It was talked about as sort of like the new Dr. Strangelove. It was this very funny British comedy. It was a satire on government, basically, and all of the weird miscommunications and in incompetences and just all of the, you know, idiocy that we see in modern government. And it was it had a really good buzz about it. And then uh they had a show, right, on the BBC. They had a really popular show. Yeah, that was called In the Thick of It. Right, and In the Thick of It. And that show, that premise it was translated, this is like a spinoff. Veep is a spinoff of that show. But so this whole story that this first episode is going to latch onto about the cornstarch utensils and stuff is very much that sense of humor. It's political satire by way of absurdity. Again, like Dr. Strangelove. So- when you think about how this show, and this is really mind blowing now, managed to be a comedy about Washington politicians for however many years and never actually reveal what party she was from, the idea of having political satire that wasn't even partisan exactly is very much in this guy's wheelhouse. Right. And we do get a few, I mean, they're like sprinkled throughout the series. Veep is a favorite of ours. We watch that as part of our current, um, we make our own TGIF lineup as we've talked about on the podcast before. And Veep is currently in that lineup. But we do get uh, with Vice President Selena Meyer throughout the series, we'll get bits and, and bobs of where she is is not comfortable saying certain things, but they are these generic political tropes. Like you can't say you hate the gays or you can't say that you don't care about, you know, the trans community or you can't say like it's all of these things where like, well, you can't say that you that you don't care, but I do care. But oh, can you believe that? But also and so they kind of walk that line of the political platitudes. It's about, yeah, it's about being a politician and what they're satiring is politics and politicians in general. In the fact that they actually don't care about anything or anyone except lining their own pockets. Yeah. And so they're going to say one thing to one group and another thing to another group. And that's true for everyone. And on all, all, of sides. The, all of the house of cards maneuvering and all of that kind of stuff. But it is, even in the relatively short amount of time that has passed since they made this show, it feels different. You know, I wonder how that would fly today, where now we're all so polarized and the people that we disagree with politically, we tend to think of as evil. Stuff like this that takes that approach of like, yeah, but they're all a bunch of schmoes, aren't they? It's kind of like, no, no, we don't want to equivocate the, you know, generic political lameness of one party with the absolute moral, you know, cynicism of the other party. And so it's an interesting, you know, it's just an interesting change that's happened even since this show was made. Well, and I think now and even during while this show was on. I mean, the show came out in 2012. Like we were pretty divided 11 years ago, for sure. You know, Fox News started in what, like 99 or something. So we've been there. Um, but I think 
we're in a place now where we where you have to call out the other like you're no longer allowed to say i believe this thing and it's okay if my friends on the other side don't you have to say that it is unacceptable that my you know that my enemies on the other side are saying this like you have to speak in hyperbole and that is the opposite of what this show is doing the other side of that or the other like you know, sort of facet to that is I think if you if you are conservative and or particularly like the populist kind of Trump conservative that we're seeing nowadays, watching a show like this, hearing that this is supposed to be in the middle, that's a reason that you would say all media is Democrat. Like all media is liberal. It's liberal. It's liberal. What they're calling down the middle in the show Veep is liberal. Her very first bill she's trying to get passed is the clean jobs bill. Don't try to tell me that this isn't a show about Democrats. Yeah. But again, I think that's the joke of that idea is like clean jobs is exactly, it's just a weird portmanteau of like clean energy and like something, you know, like it's just supposed to be nonsense. That doesn't mean anything. Yeah. I guess my, my, my overall point is just that we're finally getting, I think again, no offense to Brad, what's his face and the guy who created or the gal who created the Christine show, but now we're getting a really unique voice and worldview that's ready to take Julia Louis-Dreyfus and her whole deal and sort of channel that into something where they have a really strong idea for it. And it's not just like, hey, what can we do with JLD? You know, everyone likes her. Now there's a really, you know, there, there's a really strong concept. Right. And because yet again, we have this cast of characters around her that's very strong. You've got Reed Scott, who's on every show under the sun. You've got Anna Chomsky. You've got the guy who plays Mike, who's like this Matt character. Walsh. He's one of the original Upright Citizens, but great brigade guy. Yeah. I mean, you see him in everything. Like you, you see this guy, you're like, oh, he's in those six things that I've seen. Um, we've got what's his face from um, Tony Hale from oh, Arrested sure. Development. Hilarious. Yeah. But also there's an interesting style to this show where I noticed it's very tightly scripted. The the jokes in this, you know, you mentioned Sorkin. It's not exactly like Sorkin style, but it is very clever and there's lots of clearly thought through digs and jabs and turns of phrase that people make on this. And yet that shooting style where it's very shaky and intimate and it's got that same sort of uh, faux documentary feel, it makes it feel kind of off the cuff and spontaneous. And so- Yeah. And the fact that they're all kind of throwing those out and talking over one another in yeah. the same way that you do when you're in. So- this show, if you don't know Veep, JLD is the vice president and all of the cast of characters that we just named are her staff. And so you've got her chief of staff. Her name's Amy. That's played by Anna Chomsky. You've got her communications director. That's Matt Walsh. You've got another person on the communications team. That's Dan, played by Reed Scott. So like all of these people are her staff. And Tony Hale is her body man, meaning he's the guy that like hands her the lipstick, gives her a stool when she needs it, like all brings her a tea, um, anything. Personal assistant, basically. Um, and so if you if you watch the West Wing, Charlie, that's who Tony Hale plays in this. And so all of these people, their entire life is to make sure the Veep looks good and they are constantly failing. Like she saves their ass in that first season so many times just by having like political prowess and being able to like charm her way out of anything. And as the series goes on, she loses that more and more because she's surrounded by this mediocrity at all times. Yeah. Well, and again, I go back to if one of JLD's superpowers is smiling and you see that desperation and exasperation start to show through, through that smile. It's just so perfect for her. And again, that air of sophistication and authority that she can put on and then show you it unraveling before your eyes. Yeah, to cast her as the vice president is just a, such a stroke of genius. It's brilliant. It allows her to play in all the things that you're talking about. 
And it also allows you to have a cast of characters that you can do lots of side stories with. So we don't end up in that boat like we did with New Christine, where it's just a show about New Christine over and over and over again. How many stories can you tell about the, you know, single mom trying to date again? This is an endless possible endless possibilities there it's another one of these huge casts where tons of guest stars and like you it's like parks and rec in that way and arrested development in that way where you have people coming on for you know i think hugh Laurie guest stars for entire yeah. seasons you know what i mean and so you have all of this opportunity to bring in lots of fun people who can play in this sandbox the writing is tight the writing is quick the jokes come fast and it so much of the comedy happens in like the fumbling of physical things in between throwing out barbs at each other because they're miserable for the most part at what <laughs> what they're doing yeah another thing that sort of crystallized for me with this is that the hallmark of all of her characters is this sort of shaky at best sense of integrity, right? That she loves to play people who just like either they're dishonest or they're just not genuine, you know? And so whether it's, you know, Christine being basically a pathological liar, or in this case, a politician, you know, and you just see her up at that podium trying to, you know, it's it's a little bit of that Michael Scott thing from The Office where she has to just sort of like meander from point to point and just keep speaking and it turns into the verbal diarrhea. It's a little bit of that, just like a real politician, just keeping that smile on and making the dumb jokes. And yeah, it's just so perfect for her. So we could talk a little bit about this episode. This episode of Veep, it introduces us to the cast of characters, as I said, and we find out the premise of the show. And one of the ongoing jokes throughout the show is every time the Veep gets back to her office, she looks at her secretary, Sue, and says, has the Sue, has the president called? And the answer is always... No. No. So it just... Without having to ever say anything other than that throughout the the first season, that's all you had to do to establish that, oh, yeah, she's the second in command ostensibly, but she is, you know, in this cordoned off corner of, you know, the working part of the White House and is not in touch with actual power. She's doing everything she can do to hang on to some type of initiative so she can be like, oh, I'm spearheading this while I sit around and wait for number one to die. And uh, that's the clean jobs bill. So she wants to get this clean jobs bill passed. She has run afoul of big plastics because she's talked about this corn starch yeah, they want to replace plastic utensils with cornstarch utensils. I've never heard of this. I don't know if it's a real thing or if it's a Armando Iannucci, you know, fabrication. But it's a perfect example of like, yeah, they latched onto this because they thought it would be a good political idea. Nobody gives a shit about whether you make utensils out of plastic or cornstarch or whatever. I mean, people do care, though. But not these people. Not these people. And in fact, the first time you see her use one of her cornstarch spoons that she's so excited about, the coffee totally melts it and it doesn't work. And she holds it up and she's like, seriously, this is what I'm out there saying is the best thing. Oh, you know, and she's all annoyed because she's like, how am I supporting this? Now I got it. Now I'm in a political trouble. I've got to go court big plastic because who, what, like who makes plastic? Oil makes plastic. So you don't want to piss off plastic because then you pissed off oil and then you're screwed. And so the end of the episode, she decides that she's going to put somebody from big oil on the clean jobs commission. So that way she has brought these two seemingly opposed things together and everybody in her office is like, wait, why isn't that just bankrupting all of your morals to do like put an oil guy on the clean jobs thing? And she's like, no, absolutely not. This is this is Washington. Yeah. So you get all of those machinations. You get her committing the faux pas of saying we were 
hoist we were hoisted by our own retard or something like that and she you know sort of steps on a landmine with that very sort of common storyline with this show and again just like you said it's all about saying the wrong thing and damage control or how to deal with that political machine it's not about the real life political issues that were no it is a comedy all the way and it's a comedy of the absurd there's again a running gag throughout the show is this bag that tony hale's character carries that has everything and anything you could ever want in it it's like a mary poppins bag you know he calls it the leviathan and it changes several times throughout the the series but yeah he pull you know he just has everything for her and it's just you know it's just silly uh, all of these things are silly there's you know everybody seems to know everybody which is kind of the way it is you know in some of these congressional offices and stuff so yeah that that is the heart of this show. The heart of this show is not, I'm going to make you feel. I think the heart of this show is, let's take a cynical look and make you laugh while we're doing it. Yeah. And sort of going back to what I was musing about at the beginning, it's just so interesting to think of how her career got this I wouldn't say renaissance per se, but she she finally got this role and this show that was such a great avenue for her and that used all of her talents and she's so perfect for it but it is like that had to happen you know like in other words she had all of those abilities but a show like veep had to come along for that to be for that to happen otherwise her next project it would be another mediocre sitcom. And so it's an interesting thing to contemplate how it is just that weird intersection of ability and luck and just sort of like where the where the cards fall, you know? She kind of addresses what you're talking about in my favorite or, you know, one of my favorite moments from the Amy Schumer show, which is Amy Schumer has this skit called Last Fuckable Day and she's walking through the woods and she comes upon Tina Fey, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, and um, one of the Arquettes and they're sitting there in the woods having tea, sending JLD off, uh, you know, because it's her last fuckable day. And and they have this great look it up. It's really funny. And there's great scenes, you know, Tina Fey and uh, Julia Louis-Dreyfus have just some awesome one-liners. It's really funny. But one of the things she says in that skit is, you know, I'm just so, I'm just so thankful they let me hang around so long. Yeah, it's really interesting. You think back to Seinfeld and how it was this cultural juggernaut. And in a lot of ways, the person that really made the most of themselves afterwards was Larry David, right? He came up with Curb Your Enthusiasm, and that's kept going in a major way, like into his 80s or something. <laughs> but Julia Louis-Dreyfus, performer-wise, really, you know, she's, I think by a sort of wide margin has had the most interesting and varied career. And like I said, I'm really glad we did this because it's, it was just interesting for me to watch her so closely and just really kind of put my finger on some of those things that I always sensed, but never could quite articulate about what makes her so interesting and how she was able to kind of hang on through those different highs and lows and, yeah, stay part of this sort of TV sitcom landscape like kind of all the time. Yeah. Well, and the other thing I think that maybe dovetails in with what you're talking about is she always plays, very often plays these like single, very frenetic, like frenzied type characters. She herself has been with the same man since she was like 20, 21 years old. You know, she and Brad Hall got married in 1987 or something like that. And they were both cast on SNL in 1982. So like, I think she is lucky and has also had the stability in her life outside of Hollywood that I think enabled her to be like, wait, stay grounded. Like, who am I? Whereas 
I think some if she was more like the characters that she was playing, she she might not have all of the you know capacities to make all those wonderful decisions or wait because someone else was working or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, she definitely comes across as very smart and grounded and normal, for lack of a better word, in real life. And uh, I think that's kind of the best that you can hope for, you know, to expect that you're going to do something on the level of Seinfeld is like, you know, the Rolling Stones are not going to have another hit like Satisfaction, you know, but that doesn't mean that they can't still make good music, you know, throughout the decades. And I think it's like that. I think her roles, especially in Veep, are as good a follow-up as you can hope for. And uh, yeah, really solid career. All right, so much for the storied career of Julia Louis-Dreyfus. What are we talking about next week? Next week, we're going on a game show. Better start studying up now because all of our episodes have to do with quiz shows. We're starting in the 1950s with The Honeymooners, Season 1, Episode 18, The $99,000 Answer. Mr. Belvedere, Season 6, Episode 2, Brain Busters. Caroline in the City. Season 3, Episode 14, Caroline and the Quiz Show. And we will finish it off with Spin City, Season 4, Episode 8 or 7, depending on the platform you're looking for it in, How to Bury a Millionaire. Yep, that is next week. And until then, we will declare this segment of the sitcom study concluded. Thank you for listening to The Sitcom Study. Tell us what you think or share your own TV tropes and topic ideas by sending a self-addressed stamped email to sitcomstudypodcast at gmail.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram. And if you like the show, consider leaving a rating or review on your podcast app. It helps us boost those precious Nielsen ratings. The Sitcom Study is recorded in front of a live studio dog. Studio dog.